I've been working on, on hardware. I work in hardware and advanced uh, displays and images. I've been working on that really my whole adult life. And these days in Asia using trailing edge fabs to get 10, 100, 1,000x performance in, in devices and screens and technologies that really ship. And I've uh, shipped really millions of things this way. And I want to take that know-how and roll it back on itself on mental images. And I'll, I'll sort of sort of bear with me a little bit on, on why we want to do this. Uh, you know, the screen, as, as the last book speaker mentioned, it's, it's really the key. It's the bottleneck. It's the most expensive component in a device. It's the most power hungry, by far, component in the device. And it's the bottleneck. The world's information is digital, and the way we access it is through the screen. Uh, and indeed, half of our minds are allocated to processing visual images. It's how we think, it's, it's who we are, it's embedded deeply into us. We think in mental images. So if we look at a future of screens, sure we're going to have screens on lots more surfaces. They're going to be stretchable and foldable and maybe even exhalable or spray paint them and beam information to them from our cell phones. But in the limit, the problem really becomes, when you really think of it, how do we get these images, these mental images we have in our mind out of our mind. And uh, you know, the goal really is to try to communicate better with each other. And that is through fundamentally what we use half of our minds for, which is thinking in mental images. So there's been a lot going on in the world of neuroscience. And this is a quick update. This is from 2004 from uh, Harvard, uh, Gannis et al. And here's, here, this is fMRI data. And this is what I'm, I'm trying to make a little bit better, higher resolution, 10, 100x resolution higher, and we can get there. And so in this study, on the left-hand side, uh, a, a subject was shown images. And this is where the fMRI ma map lights up on the left-hand side. These are in the front of the brain. In the middle column, the areas that light up are when the subject imagines seeing that very same image. And on the right-hand side, the difference between the two, which is nothing. Here we go to the middle of the brain, and the slices on the left-hand side are what lights up when the subject looks at an image, the middle, when they imagine seeing that image, and the right-hand side, the difference between the two, which is nothing. And here we're on the slices of the back of the brain, and same thing, same lineup. And here we see some differences. We're here we're in area V1, the striate cortex. There are some differences. But overall, the similarity is remarkable. The correlation between what we see, what lights up when we see something versus imagining seeing, them, seeing that same image is remarkably similar. So there's more recent data. This is from six months ago, uh, a group at Berkeley, uh, Nishimoto and, and Gallant's lab at Berkeley. And let me set this up for you. Here the subjects were shown hundreds of hours of YouTube videos. And an MRI map was made of what areas of their mind lit up under fMRI when they were shown different image sequences. And then after this sort of dictionary, if you will, of each subject's mind was made for these hundreds of hours of YouTube video, a new video was shown, and an fMRI recording was made of their brain. And let me just roll that. Can we roll that clip? So here you see for each subject, subject one, two, and three, the seven most nearest matches from the YouTube data store that lit up those areas of the fMRI. And on the left-hand side, an amalgamation of those images as compared to the image sequence they're being shown. It's really similar. So there's, there's, there's a lot going on in this video. So let me just let me show a, a, a quick summary here. Again, this is the presented clip. And this is going into the map of the fMRI sort of library, if you will of the data store from the 100 hours of video. They've never seen that presented. Pardon? This is the first time they're seeing that presented. No, this is not. This, is, this was published six months ago by a, a group at Berkeley. No, I'm sorry. In this example, though, they're seeing it presented for the first time in your technique to the right? That's correct. That's correct. So this is 
an fMRI map of, of what, based on the areas of the brain that were excited, looking at that hundred hour of, hundred, hundreds of hours of YouTube data and creating an amalgamation of the images to guess what the person is looking at. It's mighty similar. And so what this is saying is, this doesn't sound so crackpot anymore. We're getting close. We just have to up the resolution by 100x. Even 10x, and you could really start to change things. You could change every field, every field that exists. Because it is how we think about things. It is fundamental to who we are. And so the question is, you know, how do we up the resolution? This was done with two millimeter voxels, imaging two millimeter, two by two by two and a half millimeter voxels of oxygenated blood flow. That's what fMRI measures. It doesn't even measure the actual neurotransmitters. It measures it over four seconds, but we're close enough where we could actually do this. And this could be very important for things like witnessing a crime, psychology, many, many, many fields. There's ethical concerns, there's legal issues, there's all kinds of issues. But we're getting that close. All we have to do is up the resolution a little bit and get more big data store and computational techniques. So I'm working on upping the resolution more because that's what I do. And there's three different techniques I'm approaching. One is using feeding back a lot of the new camera techniques that are being used. And I'll talk a little bit more about that structured field, light field, things like that, back in the electromagnetic domain. Number two is more of a phase holographic type interference structure to, to create radically higher resolution. And number three, which might sound the craziest but actually isn't, is getting the whole thing to run in reverse and pulling the image right off the retina as if the movie screen is the retina. And there's a lot of data that shows that's possible. So just quickly, let me touch on, on three of these. While Kodak went out of business last month quietly, there's a new era of photography being born that's getting radical new resolution by uh, collecting different light fields, collect, putting different sequences of light and structures of light on objects with big data computation techniques to extract a lot more image, image data than, than even the human visual system can do um, to create new kinds of machine vision systems that people thought were really impossible just you know, a couple years ago. And so can we take these techniques and fold them back down, back into, outside of the visible regime, into the electromagnetic spectrum regime of, of fMRI? And that I think that we can, and we're working on applying those techniques there. There's another approach of using the ENM field inside the fMRI to actually create holograms, if you will. In that case, you could get submicron structures. Is there noise? Yes, there's a lot of noise. But if you're submicron and you miss it by a little bit, you could miss it by, you know, a thousand times and still get higher resolution than we're getting now. And there's a lot of indication that this, this technique is, is also possible. And then finally, uh, pulling images off the retina. We could do that right now with everybody in the room. Just, just shine some near-infrared light on your retina. Rhodopsin changes. Uh, it's, a, it's a pigment. It's an electro-optic pigment. It changes its color and its voltage as a function of applied light. And you can pick that off with invisible light and see which is excited and pull that image off. What you've got to do is get your neurons to run in reverse. Sounds crazy, but people are doing it. There's a group at Northeastern this year that got neurons to run in reverse by exciting them for a while. At the, at the synapses, going through the cell body, out through the axons for a while, and then they started running in reverse. Turns out this has been happening for a while, but everybody thought they were dead, the axons were dead, and turns out they come back to life, and they've got it to happen even without external, exter external electric simulation to get those axons to run in reverse. Well, the next question is, can you do that in the optic nerve? Are those, are those special kinds of cells? Well, those are retinal ganglion cells. And for a long time, a, a material called Ephron B has worked in reverse. And, and there is an indication that we can signal out and put a voltage onto the retina. It's possible. I'm not sure which of these techniques will work. Uh, the best, but they all seem quite possible. Here's a little bit more data from the Sheffield paper I, I talked about. But again, it does seem that you can get the get the get the the axons to run in reverse, and it could work. But let's go back to that clip again. Really, this is the presented clip, and this is the guess from the existing resolution of fMRI data. 
it's so close, it's within our reach to be able to communicate our mental images with each other in just a few years, just with better data, better computation, and a little bit higher resolution. It can touch every field and increase our ability to communicate more effectively with each other and, and better understand each other. So I think it's worth doing. Thank you. Let us define X. X is a solution, a solution to a seemingly insurmountable problem, like climate change or cancer, one that affects the world. But what if we redefine X as a challenge, an opportunity for radical thinking, a chance to light up the world with breakthrough ideas and cutting edge technology, the stuff of science fiction that just might fly after all. Solving for X requires wonder and imagination and the vision to build seemingly impossible solutions to the world's biggest problems. Solve for X. Moonshot thinking.